Let's welcome Dr. Ann Leip. Thank you very much, Jean. It's quite an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you all this morning. Uh, one doesn't get a chance to share with the world very often, so I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to be with you. Um, I've been in the profession, as Dr. Barron said, for over 30 years, and working with older adults has been my primary interest and passion during that time. So what I'd like to do is just begin with a very brief overview looking at aging in the United States. Like many other places in the world, we are experiencing an aging boom. I am part of that generation in America that's called the baby boomer generation. Those of us that were born right after the Second World War from about 1946 to 1956, 57 in that age. So we are all beginning to reach these golden years. <laughs> so we're seeing a tremendous increase in life expectancy, fast growing population. But it's, it's an interesting situation. Um, I believe as, as those of us in my generation begin to age, we're seeing more diversity in the aging population. Many people are beginning second careers after finishing a first career. So we have opportunities to, pre, uh, to engage in leisure pursuits, a lot of living opportunities becoming available to people. And one thing I think we're seeing is that those people who are in care facilities are becoming increasingly more frail and more severely impaired. So let's take a brief look at music therapists who work with older adults in the United States. Um, this is a data is from a survey that is done every year by our American Music Therapy Association. They do an, a member survey. And this just gives you a, a, a little bit of a perspective on what we look like, those of us working with older adults. Um, throughout the years, it's been fairly consistent that uh, the third highest number of music therapists in the profession are working with older adults after mental health and those who work in public schools. Individuals who work with adults and, and Alzheimer's, putting that category together, still represent a sizable portion of our music therapy population. Many of these folks work in geriatric facilities or nursing homes, uh, facilities that serve psychogeriatric facilities, people with uh, dual diagnoses. So it, it's a pretty large percentage. And as you can see in 2010, 14 jobs were created in these facilities. I want to back up again a little bit. Marion Palmer was a music therapist. She's now retired and living in Florida, but I met her many years ago. And she was one of our pioneers in music therapy with older adults. And in 1989, she published an article in Music Therapy Perspectives in which she offered a vision for the future in which she saw music therapists working with older adults in a variety of different settings. And it's hard now to think back to 1989 when most of us were working in long-term care, uh, skilled nursing facilities, to try to envision a different world in which we may be working with older adults in the community or in different types of settings. But I wanted to present this as a foundation for our journey this morning, looking at at older music therapy with older adults. So let's just look at some brief history. This provides a context, I think, for where we are today. And in 1977, these is, this is where I found the earliest references to music therapy with older adults in our professional publications. Uh, Marion Palmer was one of the first ones to publish on techniques for working with older adults. And this early study by Alicia Gibbons, Alicia Clare, um, on music preferences, this is still a very widely cited article. It has been updated recently, but it's still very widely cited. 
Then in 1988, Dr. Gibbons published the first review of literature in music therapy with older adults. And one thing that jumps out for me here is her emphasis on abilities and strengths. Now we see that as very common, but back in 1988 when we still thought of older adults with dementia in terms of cognitive impairment and decline, to see an emphasis on abilities and strengths I think was something very new. She did notice an institutional bias in the literature at that time, but just the beginnings of movement into the community. And at this point, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Clare's incredible work. She's been a wonderful pioneer in this field and has given us a, a tremendous amount of wonderful research. In 1991, I collaborated with Dr. David Smith, who at the time was in Atlanta. Um, and we developed a survey, music therapy practices in gerontology. We wanted to get a feel for what the profession looked like. And you can see that we had a fairly good response, 176. Most of our respondents at this time were salaried, but what jumps out for me is how many people indicated in the survey that they were working as activities directors in nursing homes, and this was my first job as an activities staff person. I was not a director, but I was a staff person in a nursing home. And not being a director, I did have the advantage of being able to use most of my time to conduct music therapy sessions, which I think was somewhat unusual for many of my colleagues who were trying to manage activity director roles. But th this was the way things were at the time and also the most frequently reported goals and objectives that professionals were working on. So we're seeing socialization, cognitive stimulation, sensory stimulation being very important goals. Then in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, I began my doctoral work and my interest has always been in assessment. Um, I did not know at the time that my now colleague, Dr. Elizabeth York, was also working in this area. We have since collaborated on some research, but both of us were developing music-based assessments for older adults with dementia. Dr. York's residual music skills test and then my music-based evaluation of cognitive functioning. Slightly different purposes, but basically the same idea. Um, in our construct validity study that we did in 2007, we got about a 0.82 correlation between our two tools. So they are measuring the same things, but are doing it in slightly different ways. What's important, I think, the contribution of our tools is that they are both very psychometrically stable. We have good reliability, good validity data on both of our tools. And I also want to acknowledge my Korean colleagues are now working on a translation of, of my tool into Korean. So I'm very thrilled about, about that work as well. There was another milestone in 1991, just a little personal history. I was living in the Maryland and the Washington DC area at the time. And I was part of a group of music therapists who were working in gerontology in the DC area. And we got a call from Al Bumanis at national office that he, he was frenzied. He had received a call from Jonathan Edelstein, who was a, an assistant to the US Special Committee on Aging. And apparently there was some dead time in the Senate calendar in August. And Jonathan had this idea that he wanted to do a hearing on Capitol Hill on music and aging. So he contacted AMTA, it was NAMT at the time, National Association for Music Therapy. And so a committee was put together, Kathy Canole came out from uh, Texas, I believe, to be in charge of this whole effort and we spent hours at national office putting this thing together and very excited about this energy. And the hearing did occur in August of 1991. And this led to several important developments. One was when the, music, the uh, Older Americans Act was reauthorized, there was a Music Therapy for Older Americans Act as part of that reauthorization. So we have a definition of music therapy as practiced with older adult populations in federal legislation, which is very exciting. 
And the reauthorization of this act also provided some funding for some demonstration projects in music therapy. This is an example of one of those demonstration projects, a rhythm-based music therapy for older adults project. Barb Royer, Barb Crow, and Barry Bernstein worked on this. And while their book was not published until 2007, it was based on all of this work that was done initially uh, in 91. And here's some of the results of their, their work. Rhythm-based activity is still being used very widely. A lot of the protocols that were developed then are still being used. And more important emphasis on the well elderly. So we're beginning to see this emphasis now moving beyond an institutional view. In 2002, I had an opportunity to be part of another project. This was a model demonstration program in Winchester, Virginia that was directed by Dr. Michael Rohrbacher from Shenandoah University. He collaborated with Jane Bauknet, who ran the adult care center in Winchester that served approximately 15 older people with special needs. Uh, AOA grant support was received for this project and Dr. Rohrbacher had earlier developed seven functions of music therapy practice and he was interested to see whether or not we could provide some evidence for these functions with older adult populations. There were several music therapists that worked on this project and I was assigned to the wellness function. This is a very interesting uh, assignment because at the time we didn't think about wellness with older adults with dementia. So I had to basically start from scratch in developing this idea. And what I came up with, first of all, looking at, well, when we talk about wellness for people with cognitive impairments, what are we looking at? What does this involve? And some of the, th the things that emerged from this were an emphasis on identity. You know, the identity is one thing that people begin to lose when they have a dementia, is a sense of self. So restoring this sense of personal identity, um, focusing on meaning issues. What is meaningful for these individuals and how is music connected with what is meaningful? It's a very holistic emphasis in wellness and also involves a strong spiritual component. So these were just some of the elements that made up this wellness dimension that I was working with. So I developed an assessment um, looking at ways in which music might have been meaningful to people in their lives and then based on the results of that assessment uh, protocols, goals, and objectives were developed. Some of these goals, these are just a few that I selected uh, for working with the folks. Promoting opportunities for self-expression, creativity, affirming life experience. Remember Eric Erickson and his idea of the, the eight stages, the final stage of life, ego integrity versus despair, the development of wisdom. We worked a lot with that model and also an opportunity to engage with their preferred spiritual practices. Some of the themes uh, that were used in the sessions uh, were joy. We did graduations. Um, I even had a travel theme. I have been to Japan myself. I lived there when I was younger and I was familiar with Japanese culture. I had a Japanese student at the time who came and taught some Japanese songs. So we, we uh, engaged the, the folks in experiences with other cultures, which they really enjoyed quite a bit. Um, so those were some of the themes in the sessions that I used. Then I developed an evaluation protocol to go along with this. And the question that I developed for this was, what behaviors might be indicative of wellness? Some of examples, improvising gestures, um, expressing their feelings, sharing of memories and insight. So then I tallied how many times these behaviors emerged in the sessions. So this was how I developed the wellness component of this project, which was quite challenging and quite interesting. So current developments. Um, I went to look at the recent AMTA conference presentations I uh, thank Jane Cregan at National Office for her help in pooling this information. 
And this gave me an idea of where people are going now with uh, this area of practice. And one of the things that stands out, we're learning so much more about brain function and what's going on in the brain when people are engaged in a music experience. So this data also is being applied with older adults. And one thing that Alicia Clare and all, their sessions suggested, was that music seems to increase synaptic plasticity um, for people with dementia. Somehow these neuronal networks are becoming reconfigured as they're engaging in music. And this may be what underlies the observed responses that we see. Music affects the whole brain, as we know. So unaffected areas may be stimulated by music and promote healthy responses. We're also seeing a number of intergenerational programs, music therapy with older adults and younger people working together, and a lot more focus on ensemble participation and quality of life. So we're seeing this movement now out into the community. Another movement that I'm seeing is, this is a term I ran across this past year. I was teaching a course in the psychology of music and ran into this special issue of psychomusicology. This wonderful term, psychogeromusicology, is a new field that is beginning to emerge now. We're seeing psychology of aging and psychomusicology converging. And one emphasis in this special issue was lifelong development of musical skills. And I, although I could not see the video of the earlier presentation, that seemed to be something that I was hearing from the music that she was playing, that even with a severe dementia, there's a musical capacity there all the way through life. So that's a very important thing that's beginning to emerge now. And also the positive relationships between um, music involvement and quality of life indicators. Jean Cohen is a gerontologist who did a study a number of years ago looking at some of this. And I would note here that from what I re recall of this study, this was not music therapists, but professional musicians who were working with older adults in the community. For example, in Washington there was a, a, a chorus uh, at one of the long-term care facilities, the retirement center with older adults in a chorus. Um, and he looked at a lot of indicators such as overall health. He looked at the number of falls that people were experiencing, um, depression, loneliness, overall morale, and saw that in, in most cases, people who were participating in a music group had positive quality of life indicators. Better morale, less depression, fewer falls, reductions in risk factors. So we're seeing some of this research, which is very encouraging, something we can build on. And also a need to continue to build theoretical foundations for using music therapy with people all along the aging spectrum. So just a, a few words of summary. I think that Marion was a visionary back in the late 1980s. She did see what was coming down the road. So we are seeing a realization of this movement into the community, into other settings besides nursing homes. But we do need continued research, as always, so that we can develop evidence-based practice. We have a solid foundation, but we need to continue to replicate a number of these studies especially for frail older adults and people on the dementia spectrum. I'm particularly excited about um, neuroimaging types of methods and how we can involve people in those types of studies as they're actively engaging in music, people with dementia. I think it would be very exciting. Um, and also to develop best practice models for older adults in community settings. For example, for family caregiver support and people in adult care centers. What does quality of life involve? How do we use music to enhance quality of life? And I'd love to see some more work on this wellness issue in dementia. 
So I'd like to finish with a quote, actually. This is one of my favorite authors, is John O'Donohue. Um, he's an Irish, or was, I think he's passed away. He's an Irish poet and philosopher. This is from his book, Anamkara. He says, aging invites you to become aware of the sacred circle that shelters your life. Aging can be a time of great strength, poise, and confidence. Wisdom is the art of living in rhythm with your soul, your life, and the divine, of coming home to your deeper nature. Thank you.